In the headlines, condemnations as Broadcasting Commission imposes fine on Trust TV, others for airing documentaries on banditry. Equiramadu to remain in custody as UK court adjourns trial till October 31st. PDP Board of Trustees meeting holds in Abuja, silent on crisis rocking the party. And on the foreign scene, rescuers in Mexico battle to free 10 trapped coal miners. Hello and welcome to Trust TV News Update. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Hello and welcome once again. The decision by the National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, to slam a fine of 5 million naira on Trust Television Network over the broadcast of a documentary entitled Nigeria's Banditry, the inside story, has sparked widespread condemnation. The documentary was aired by the station on March 5, 2022, but the regulatory agency imposed a sanction five months after, causing many industry stakeholders and other Nigerians to accuse the federal government agency of gagging the press and denying Nigerians the right to know. In his reaction, the International Press Center Executive Director Lanre Arogundadi in a statement said the government should not dictate how the media should present its report to the public, adding that the spate of insecurity affects everyone. Credible information is key to get into the root of the situation. Similarly, the Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, in a letter signed by its Deputy Director, Kolawale Oluwadari, said the media has a duty to impart information and ideas on the issue of public importance, noting that carrying out the threat of sanction would lessen the flow of diverse viewpoints and information to the public. Meanwhile, a statement by Trust TV's management says while it is currently studying the Commission's action and weighing its options, it wishes to state unequivocally that as a television station, it believes it acted in the public interest by shedding light on the thorny issue of banditry and how it is affecting millions of citizens in the country. The Federal Executive Council has approved a contract to buy 60 utility vehicles with gadgets and associated accessories for security agencies working in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Minister of the FCT told newsmen at State House Abuja that the vehicles and equipment were valued at over 2.6 billion naira. Also on Wednesday, the Cabinet defended President Mohamed Buhari's approval of 1.5 billion naira to buy 10 Toyota Land Cruiser vehicles for the Niger Republic. Kende Amodu reports. With speculations rife that the Federal Capital Territory is under siege, it is not surprising that the Minister is boosting the capacity of security agencies with the purchase of vehicles and gadgets. But he is quick to downplay the purchase, describing it as routine. In support of the FCT administration is providing the security agencies operating within the FCT that is reflected in this memo is part of our continuous support to them. Uh, we do that in terms of providing logistic support, uh, equipment, and, and some other support. Uh, and this is just a coincidence, but it's part of our normal support to them. Uh, there is tremendous effort by all to make sure that Abuja continues to be a safe haven for all of us. Equally described as routine is the purchase of vehicles worth 1.5 billion naira for the Niger Republic. Minister of Finance Zainab Ahmed says it is not the first time Nigeria has had to support its neighbors to enhance their capacity to secure their countries. Also on Wednesday, the Council of Ministers announced the concession in arrangement of the Badagri Deep Sea Port under a public-private partnership. The project cost approved by the Cabinet stood at $2.59 billion, while it was approved that the seaport will be developed in four phases with a concessional period of 45 years. This project, it may interest you to know, will also generate a total revenue of over $53.6 billion over the concession period. It will create about one quarter million jobs and also uh, attract foreign direct investments to the country and help in improving Nigeria's economy in general and the well-being of Nigerians. Meanwhile, the Federal Executive Council has approved a national monitoring and evaluation policy for the country. 
This will establish a framework to promote good governance and accountability. From State House Abuja, Kende Amodu, Trust TV News. The leadership of the Nigerian Senate has held a closed door meeting with heads of security agencies over worsening insecurity in Nigeria. The meeting, chaired by the President of the Senate, Ahmed Lowen, was attended by other principal officers of the Senate and chairman of security related committees. The report. In attendance were Chief of Defense Staff, the Inspector General of Police, the Commandant General of the Civil Defense Corps, Director General of the National Intelligence Agency, as well as Director General of the Department of State Service. In his opening remarks before the closed door meeting, the Senate President, Hamid Lawa, declared that Nigeria is at a crossroad with its very existence under threat, owing to the growing insecurity in the country. The security situation of Nigeria would have been far better. And Nigeria would have made more progress, not only in the area of security, but in the area of our economy, which is tied to the security situation again. I believe that um, our security agencies and armed forces have been doing their best. But apparently, we have to do more to achieve what we desire to achieve. The Senate President told security chiefs that the level of insecurity was frightening. Lawa, who attributed the low national revenue to crude oil theft, maintained that the expectation is to begin to see drastic improvement in the security situation. This current present position where we are is most frightening because it's like there's nowhere to hide or nowhere to go. It's like insecurity is everywhere and especially if it is coming to the point of dislocating the security situation where the head, I mean, the head of government or where the government headquartered. So we, we really have to review and see what more we have to do and how differently we have to, to do. On his part, the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Lucky Rabo, who noted that the issues of national security must be seen from a collective perspective, said a lot has happened with more being done to improve the security situation of the country. That quite a lot has happened, quite a lot has been done, quite a lot is being done to ensure that we improve on the security setting across the country. No one is leaving any stone on turn and redressing all the imbalances within the security environment. The meeting, which was at the instance of the Senate leadership, is to come up with practical solutions for insecurity in the country. The National Defense College Abuja celebrates its 30th anniversary. It has seized the opportunity of the ceremony to proffer solutions to the security challenges bedeviling the country. Part of the anniversary was the graduation of 2,549 participants and senior officers from Nigeria and other African countries, including Uganda, Burkina Faso, Liberia, among other countries, in the last 30 years. Delivering the graduation lecture virtually on Wednesday, Rwandan President Paul Kagame congratulated the course 30 graduates, who are now among senior officers responsible for the overall security of their respective countries. Kagame stressed the need for support through regional and bilateral cohesion to address the security threats Nigeria faces, highlighting the role of the armed forces as the pillar of any well-governed and developed state. Is so the security establishment has to play a positive role within the structures of governance, otherwise sustainable development cannot occur. If roads are unsafe, they are to be traded. If citizens fear attack, there will be no investment. 
And if education is disrupted, the conflict cycle will continue for another generation. But it goes even deeper than that. Defense and security go hand in hand with the governance. The two systems have to reinforce each other without working in silos. That means it is just as important for defense forces to invest in training and citizen outreach activities as in equipment and infrastructure. Security is ultimately about the mindset that prevails in the country. A long-term, future-oriented way of thinking is what makes development sustainable. It's about building trust between citizens and the public institutions that serve them. Citizens need to feel not only physically safe, but also fully included in the governance. One of the freed victims of the Kaduna Abuja train attack said dialogue between abductors of train passengers and the federal government will go a long way in securing the release of the remaining victims still in captivity. The released victim made this known during an interview with Trust TV in Kaduna while narrating his ordeal in the hands of the kidnappers. After spending 127 days in captivity, Mukhtar Shaibu, one of the passengers abducted by the terrorists, is free alongside others. He said they all went through unexplainable trauma, anxiety and fear of being killed at any time with inhumane conditions of living. Exactly what will happen every moment is our fear because we are afraid. Anything can happen anytime by anybody. So that is our fear. So I am calling on the government, I'm pleading to come to the aid of our brothers that are over there so that they can gain their freedom. Dialogue in my religion, Islam, dialogue is still the best option to get our brothers back home. I'm pleading to the government. Despite the fact they've taken a position, they should please listen to our yearning. We left our brothers there. I'm back home, but I'm not sleeping. Meanwhile, the federal government on Wednesday said the Abuja Kaduna rail line will not resume until all those kidnapped by bandits in March are rescued and reunited with their families. Minister of Transportation Maazu Sambu disclosed this during an inspection visit to the Idu and Kubwa train stations in Abuja. He said the federal government was deploying advanced technologies to rail services across the country to forestall similar security breaches. On Tuesday, five of the abducted passengers regained their freedom, bringing the total number of released victims to 37. However, about 35 passengers remain in the captivity of the bandits. The family of the abducted passengers have re led several protests demanding the government to facilitate the release of their loved ones. The Federal Capital Territory Administration has pulled down trees and shanties at a forest in Pasali along Kuji Gwagwaleda Road, suspected to be a haven for bandits and other criminal elements. According to reports, the Department of Development, Control and Sanitation executed the demolition on Wednesday. The FCTA had earlier warned plans to remove illegal structures along the Tipa Garage and Kuji Gwagwaleda Road access. The Senior Special Assistant on Monitoring, Inspection and Enforcement to the FCT Minister, Ikaro Atta, told newsmen after the exercise that the aim was to clear the area of illegalities and restore it to the approved master plan. Meanwhile, former Deputy Senate President Ike Ekweremadu will remain in prison till October 31st as his organ harvesting case has been adjourned again. Akwerabadu appeared in court on Thursday, anticipating ruling in his bail application, but the judge adjourned the case till the end of October for a hearing. It can be recalled that the Nigerian senator first appeared before the Uxbridge Magistrates Court in London, where the lawmaker denied all the charges against him. Akwerabadu and his wife were initially denied bail and remanded in custody, while the case was adjourned to July 7th and later August 4th. However, on July 2nd, his wife Beatrice was granted bail under strict conditions. Kweramadu put in a request for a new counsel on Wednesday. 
Adam Bulkachua, Senate Committee Chairman on Foreign Affairs, was in court to show support for Ekwaramadu. The court allowed only 20 people to witness proceedings, and all recording devices were not allowed into the courtroom. You're watching Trust TV News Update. And still to come, after the break, Borno Flyover Builder goes to school. Details of this and more after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us on Trust TV News Update. Now a recap of our top stories. Condemnations as Broadcasting Commission imposes fine on Trust TV, others for airing documentaries on banditry. Ekwaremadu to remain in custody as UK court adjourns trial till October 31st. Moving on to other stories now, the People's Democratic Party Board of Trustees met in Abuja on Wednesday to discuss critical issues affecting the party. Top among the issues is the lingering acrimony between River State Governor Nyesom Wike and his presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar as a fallout of the party's presidential primary. Speaking shortly after the meeting on behalf of the BOT, Senator Abdul Ningi declined to make public the grievances of the governor saying the committee has been set up to hold a meeting with Atiku Abubakar and reach out to Wiki to find solutions to the existing acrimony between the two parties. Meeting, committee of the BOT to be able to interface between warring factions, particularly between the acrimony that is taking place between the, the presidential candidate and Bunawuke and any other a conflict that is taking place in the nation within our party uh, formation. The Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offences Commission, ICPC, is partnering relevant stakeholders to curb vote buying during elections in the country. The Commission's Chief Superintendent of Public Enlightenment, Femi Gold, stated this in an interview with newsmen in Abuja said beyond the arrest and prosecution of vote buyers, the ICPC was intensifying sensitization campaigns in collaboration with stakeholders against the menace. The official said while the commission will continue to arrest vote traders, sensitization was key in curbing the illegal act. Gold said as part of efforts, the ICPC had signed a memorandum of understanding with the Independent National Electoral Commission to strengthen the campaign against vote buying. Journalists and public relations practitioners have agreed to cross-fertilize ideas to check the menace of quackery in the media space. They are, however, appealing to government to accord the media its appropriate status. Dashen Husseina Usman has more. There is a growing consensus that systems should be put in place to check quackery in the media industry. The onus is on journalists to bring up the right set of professionals to retool the system. At the head of public relations professionals is Dr. Mukhtar Saraju, who is stressing the need for strategic advocacy. Saraju brings to the fore the challenges journalists face in Nigeria, suing for developmental journalism and conflict-sensitive reporting. We are here to see how we can partner with the NEG to ensure that both the journalism and PR professions are read of quacks. We are prepared to listen to the NUJ 
and uh, of course I believe it will also listen to us to see how we can cross fertilize ideas to fight this menace. Otherwise, we will continue to be embarrassed unnecessarily by people who have no business being anywhere near our two professions. The national president, Nigeria Union of Journalists, Chris Isiguzo, tasks journalists to shun religion, not pander to political actors, and to discuss Nigeria in earnest. He buttressed the need to change the perception the public has about journalists as communicators by setting a new agenda and applying their roles to the expectation of society. When Nigeria is divided along religious lines, tribal lines, ethnic lines, political lines. I don't think there has been any time in the nation's history that we've been this divided. But we are not going to give up. I'm an incurable optimist when it comes to keeping hope alive. I believe that all of us together must work together, must join hands, and build this, the country of our dreams. Journalists have tried to weed out quackery, but the consensus is that there is the need to do more as perception managers. Dashan Husseina Usman, Trust TV News, Abuja. Mohammed Sani, a 13-year-old boy, caught the attention of the world when he constructed the replica of the new Meduguri using sticks and mud. He is now placed on full scholarship in one private school by the Borno State Government. Guruzi Beatrice has been monitoring the development and he meets the boy to find out the inspiration behind his creativity. This is the Meduguri City flyover, first of its kind in Borno State. Its beauty inspired 13-year-old Musa Sani to build a replica of the bridge with mud, cement, paint, and sticks. His parents said Musa has been making wonderful art right from age five. He loves art, passion for sculpting, and have a dream of becoming a civil engineer someday. <laughs> When I see something beautiful, I mold it. Like when my mom took me out, we passed the customs flyover. I loved the view. So I went on my own one day, took a critical look of it, then came home and looked for materials to mold it. I wish I could have a big space where I can design lots of things, have a house of our own and don't walk to school every day. His mother said his talent amazed her and the family. She said he'd never learned designing from school nor textbooks, but does it with passion and accuracy, adding that it is her hope to support him to do more amazing things in the future. <laughs> He has been designing since at the age of five. When I noticed the beautiful work, I started buying materials for him. But when he does it, children destroys it. So he keeps it close to his bed. I wish we have the means to get a big house where there's open field so he can continue molding things. I know he's going to become someone in future. And I pray for God's intervention so I can take care of him and my other children. Like every child, Musa hope one day he will be able to build a house for his parents and a huge company that can support other children's creativity. But for now, he is focusing on the education that will pave way for him to achieve his dreams. The Corporate Affairs Commission has announced that the national identification number will take the place of applicant signatures for business and company registration. This was revealed by the Registrar General of the CAC, Garba Abubakar, as he disclosed the affiliation between the CAC and the National Identity Management Commission, NIMSI. 
According to him, the CAC alongside NMC have advanced in their reform initiatives for efficient service delivery. Abu Bakr explained that the CAC might merely require NIN enrollment numbers, which were available in other jurisdictions instead of signatures to process registration. And on the foreign scene, authorities in Mexico says rescuers battling to free 10 workers believed to be trapped in a coal mine in the northern part of the country. Three other miners were found alive. President Andres Manuel López Obrador said military personnel and rescue dogs were deployed to the scene of the accident in the state of Coahuila. The security ministry said later that three had been rescued and taken to hospital, while ten were still believed to be inside. The ministry said the rescue efforts will not stop until they are found. And finally, in sports, Chelsea have completed the signing of Kani Chukwemeka from Aston Villa. The club announced on Thursday. Tuchel continues to reinforce Chelsea with the fourth signing of the summer. The London club had earlier announced that they had reached an agreement with Villa for the 18-year-old's permanent transfer to Stamford Bridge, as Thomas Tuchel continues to reinforce his squad ahead of the 2022-23 Premier League season. And that wraps up Cross TV News Update for this hour. For more news, you can subscribe and follow us across all our social media platforms. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Thanks for watching.